Children are rarely surprised by divorce. They don't love it, they don't want it to happen. They may cry about it, but they sense disharmony in a relationship. You wanna make sure that you're creating a supportive environment externally for your children, not just in your homes, but that your extended family on both sides. Welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And today we are talking about how you, if you are getting divorced, can be the anchor in the storm, how you can be the guiding light, helping your children through the waves of divorce. And divorce definitely occurs in waves, right? It may, it, it may feel like you're just getting slammed by the surf and you know, ultimately a rich in relationship, but we teach people to do is how to ride those waves so they don't feel like they're being slammed anymore. We are in the middle of a series on divorce and the trauma that it can be when we are handling it as if everything is going to be unexpected. And we are doing this series so that you have no more unexpecteds. And today we're talking all about children and divorce, right? Uh, and our programs here for years have been child focused. My what is all about helping parents to build bridges so that they can shield their children from destructive conflict and better nurture them, shield them from the waves of conflict that happen in the divorce process. And if we're really going to understand this, we need to understand how children work, number one, we need to understand the divorce process and we need to understand when things really go wrong for them and when to be there for them, basically. All right, so the first thing you need to understand is that children are rarely surprised by divorce. They don't love it. They don't want it to happen. They may cry about it, but they sense disharmony in a relationship, even if you've been conflict averse throughout your marriage, even if you have been avoiding conflict only to have the occasional blow up, your children have sensed the tension in the room. They are perhaps unable to identify what that tension is about, but they know what it feels like when everybody's happy and they know what it feels like when everybody's sad and they know what it feels like when everything's tense, they know that that is not their ideal state, all right? Their ideal state is consistency. Their ideal state is a sense of safety, right? And safety comes when both parents are in harmony. Safety comes when both parents are walking in lockstep. Safety happens when both parents are hearing the same drummer. But when each parent is drumming out their own war beat, even if it's not being expressed verbally and in action, kids sense it. And I want you to think back to when you were a child and all those times when there was tension between your parents, even if nothing happened, you knew everybody was walking on eggshells. Well, that's how it's been for your kids. And if you're getting divorced, they're not totally surprised. Again, they may not love it. They may not be happy about it. They may be hoping that the divorce is going to end and that you're going to get back together. In fact, I promise you that on an irrational level, that is what they hope. The reactions of children when they find out their parents are getting divorced vary completely on where they are developmentally in their age. Also on their personality, of course. I can't speak a lot to personalities. I mean, I could do a whole episode just on personality, but I can give you some guidelines for age. And so the basic guidelines developmentally are zero to seven. These are the years where the child's operating system is being laid in, and they are in many ways just not sure how to react. 7 to 12, the operating system it has been in place and now they're practicing. And so they're gonna, going to have reactions, maybe even pre predictable reactions based on how you and your partner react in the environment they grow up in. 
12 to 18, that system is now a finely humming machine uh, until puberty when it gets disturbed, disturbed and turned upside down. And so a lot of what's going on at this age is figuring out how does everything I've learned about how to operate in my family, how does everything I've learned about how to operate in my community, how does everything I've learned about how to operate with my peers, with teachers, how does that all apply now that I seem to be changing and becoming more like adults and less like I was? And of course, there's 16 to 22, which is when the foundations of who we are really start to gel. And the impact of divorce is going to be very different depending on where your child is in this in these stages. The truth is that the younger your child is, the more resilient they're going to and the faster they're going to recover. And the older they are, the more they're going to have some cracks in their foundation or maybe some glitches in their operating system. A misconcept or a misunderstanding that many of us have about children is that once they reach quote unquote adulthood, which it appears to be when you're old enough to carry a gun, which is 18, or old enough to drink, which is 21 in a lot of states. Once your child reaches adulthood, they're not gonna they're gonna be fine with getting the divorce because they're adults now. They're gonna understand. But the studies show that actually adult children of divorce have an even harder time adjusting to the circumstances of their parents' divorce. The reason for this is as young adults, their sense of self has started to become more concrete. And then all of a sudden the parents say, oh, you're in college now, or you graduated from college. Guess what? We've been playing along just until you grew up because we didn't really want to be together. We're going to sell your mar your home that you grew up in. We're going to live separately. We're going to start dating other people and everything you thought you knew about us, it turns out you didn't know. And so at that age, when divorce comes, it, it can be actually be more disturbing, the opposite of what most people think. And parents will make the mistake of confiding in their adult children. Oh, he's so awful. You don't know how he is, or she's such a da da da. You don't know how she is, which puts them in the middle, still verboten in any divorce situation, or they'll use them as mediators also verboten, all right? The marital relationship between the parents or the dissolution of the marital relationship between parents is never to be shared with the children until they are ready to marry and they want advice based on your experience. That's basically the law on this if you want to leave your children unaffected. It is super important that you be honest with your children, but that that communication be age appropriate. So you're not going to go to your five-year-old and say, daddy has been cheating and so we're getting divorced because your five-year-old really doesn't know or care what cheating is. And honestly, at any age, that might be too much information. Like going back to the primary rule, any information about the marriage, about how it works or doesn't work, is not anything your children need to hear about. It's between you and the other parent and your therapists and your coaches and your religious leaders and your lawyers, not necessarily in that order. Maybe your friends. An honest communication would be mommy and daddy are not going to live together anymore. An honest communication would be to speak to some of the emotional needs of children at any age. And the emotional need of children at any age is going to be this. Unconsciously, no matter what age they are, they will feel that in some way they are responsible for the dissolution of the marriage. There may be exceptions to this, but almost all the children, adult children I've talked to and children I've talked to whose parents have gotten divorced or are getting divorced, have said to me at one time or another, they felt responsible. They didn't know why. And so the most important thing you can say to them is, 
mommy and daddy are getting divorced and it has nothing to do with you or who you are. You haven't done anything wrong. This is between mommy and daddy. And there, you cannot say that to them enough because it's going to keep coming up for them. The next most important thing to say to them is not just I love you no matter what, but mommy and daddy love you no matter what. No matter how angry you are with the person on the other side, the best thing you can do for your children is to remind them that you both love them no matter what. You may not always agree on what that means or how to how to show that love, but you know that you both love them. And it's a good exercise for you also to remember that the other parent really does love those children. What else can I tell you about this? I got a dog crashing in here. Man, this thing with doing podcasts and dogs, it is something. Yes, you may come in. Oh, he's brought me some scissors. This is amazing. Thank you. You're the best dog. And he's been chewing on them too. Lovely. All right. So now that Toby's in the room, let us continue. You don't want to share more, any more with them than that, than what I just said. All right, that's it. They don't need to know why you're getting divorced. They don't need to know what's been going on. They don't need to know whose fault it is. They don't need to know how angry you are, except that it might be like this. I'm very angry with mommy slash daddy, and that has nothing to do with you, and I'll get over it, right? Sometimes people get mad at each other. It's a feeling that we have. We'll get past it, right? That's about it. You do not want to explain to them why you're angry or why you're having the feelings that you're having. And just like in the case of the adult children of divorce, you do not want to turn your children into confidants. You don't want to explain to them how you're feeling, what's going on for you. I had one client whose mom used to have him bring drinks to her in the bathtub while she was getting divorced when he was 11 years old. Totally inappropriate for that child, all right? We don't want to put them in the middle. We don't want them to become our best friends. We don't want them to become mediators. We don't want them to become messengers. Do not pass messages back and forth with using your kids. Keep them completely out. If you're having trouble communication with the other parent, find another means to do it. Do not use your children, all right? Keep them out of it. The only relationship that you need to have with your children is that of a loving parent who is there for them no matter what, all right? And in order to do that, you're going to maintain any routines that you can. If you're living separately, obviously routines are going to change, but you want your bedtime routines to be the same. You want your holiday routines to be the same as much as possible. Yeah, they're probably going to be celebrating holidays in two households, but you want to keep to the best of your ability the traditions that you had so that it feels kind of the same, even though it isn't. The more traditions and routines that you maintain, the more consistency the children will experience. The more consistency the children will experience, no matter what age they are, the more secure they're going to feel. You're going to do your best to maintain a balance between new changes and old routines here. You do not want to flood them with the new. And you want to keep as much of the old as possible, unless they've outgrown it. If they've outgrown it, that's a whole nother deal. You're going to want to address their feelings and their concerns. That means encouraging them to express their feelings. It doesn't mean yanking it out like a sore tooth, though. You don't want to say, how are you feeling? What do you mean you're not feeling anything? What do you mean you're fine? All right. The, probably the best way to do this is when you're driving somewhere to have conversations with them about what's going on with them situationally. And the more comfortable they feel and the more at ease they feel, the more they're likely to come out with what's going on for them and ask you questions. Don't pry, but what you want to do is you want to create environments and situations that feel secure and safe and where both of your attentions are focused on the road or maybe on an activity that you're doing together like puzzle building or uh, maybe you're coloring or whatever it is. Activities together where your attention is focused on the same thing, but you can still talk. You know, wouldn't want to do that at a movie, for example. Um, that's going to be really helpful. You're going to want to validate and address their concerns, right? When they say, ah, oh, 
I'm just so mad at you both. Why are you doing this? Instead of explaining why you're doing it, you're going to say, of course you're mad. I just acknowledge their feeling. Of course you're mad. I don't, uh, who wouldn't be mad? Or of course you're scared. Who wouldn't be scared? All right. Don't try and explain it away. Oh, don't, don't like a lot of parents go to this place. Oh, it'll be okay. Don't worry. That's the last place, literally the last place you're going to go. The first place you're going to go is, of course you're scared. Of course you're hurt. Of course you're angry. Of course you miss mommy. Of course you miss daddy. And then you're, then you're going to go to, you know what? These feelings are going to pass. It's okay for you to have them. They are going to pass. It's going to be better sooner. And if you're lucky, they're having those conversations with you. But honestly, the more likely outcome is that while you're getting divorced, they're going to probably be on their best behavior, right? Why? Because they're hoping that if they're on their best behavior, you won't get divorced. Because even though you've told them, it's not your fault. It's not your responsibility. It has nothing to do with you. They feel like it does. And they're going to be acting as good as good can be, hoping that that will fix it. And it's an unconscious thing, right? And just allow them to do it. And if and when they express their feelings and concerns, if and when it feels safe enough for them to actually express those fears, hurts, anxieties, anger, blame, whatever, great, validate the crap out of them. Hopefully, the other parent is going to be on the same page as you around these things, all right? And so now let me introduce you to a concept. Two concepts, in fact. There is a scale of parenting, and this scale exists whether you're married or divorced, all right? On one end of the scale is what's called parallel parenting, and on the other end is what's called co-parenting. Parallel parenting is when two parents disagree about how to parent, and they do things completely differently. Co-parenting is where parents are in complete harmony on everything and agree on everything. And children have no opportunity to split their parents because they know that they agree completely. They don't go to daddy when mommy says no because they know what daddy's going to say, for example. People in my profession love to harp on co-parenting, co-parenting. Oh, you want to be a good co-parent, but let's be real. The greatest, most harmonious married couple in the world is not a 10 on the co-parenting scale. All right. In fact, I've met married couples who are a one on that scale. They're parallel parents. If, if five is neutral and zero is horrendous and 10 is perfect, they're a one. All right. And so... Don't feel bad if you guys don't agree on everything. And don't feel bad because you're never going to agree on everything. Or only when there's a crisis are you likely to agree on everything. However, you do want to establish during the divorce process how things are going to be the same in both households. Simple things like start with logistics. Pick up time, drop off time. Bedtime, getting up time. Uh, getting up routine, going to bed routine. The things that you're going to, that you did when you were married, hopefully. Any kind of routine that you can repeat, repeat in both households is going to make them feel secure. Next, it might be around, you might have some goals or some shared values around education or around spirituality uh, and religion uh, or around family gatherings and family relationships. The more you can get on the same page about these things, the better it's going to be for them. The last place you want to be in the world is where they can split you because one of you is the good parent and the other one is the bad parent. Now, I say that a little tongue in cheek because truthfully, there's always a good cop and a bad cop, right? But if you're going to play good cop and bad cop, you both need to know that you're doing it and do it without resentment and just be okay with that. And maybe when you're divorced, one of you is going to be the good cop about some things and the other one is going to be the good cop about other things instead of what typically happens in marriage, which is one parent is regularly the good cop and one parent is regularly the bad cop. You want to get your kids some professional support, all right? The first place to go to is the school. The school is your best resource. Almost every school has a school counselor, psychologist, or therapist now. 
make sure your child is using that service. Go to the school and say, we are getting divorced. I want to make sure that my child is talking to the school psychologist, therapist, counselor, please. Could you please reach out to them? Also encourage your children to talk to them. Encourage and do it by example. You know, hire a coach, hire a therapist, hire people to support you. Uh, do whatever you need to do to exemplify to them that it's okay to share your feelings with other people who are professionals. Here's a really big thing. You got to be a taking care of yourself. You need to make sure you're taking care of your body. Make sure you're taking care of your mind. Make sure you're taking your spirit. And last of all, well, not quite last of all, but getting near to the end of this, all right? You want to make sure that you're creating a supportive environment externally for your children, not just in your homes, but that your extended family on both sides, hers and yours or his and yours, are in on this and have some agreement about the, how this is going to handled, be handled, right? So probably what you want to be doing is going to your parents and they go to their parents. You probably want to talk to your other parent about this and say, listen, it's really important that our families don't take sides here, even though they're going to naturally. We need to say to them that as far as they're concerned, both parents are awesome, even if they don't think so, because that's what our kids need to hear. If you can get that kind of agreement, you guys are rock stars. Like that's pretty rare and unusual, by the way, right? But I'm just saying that's an ideal to reach for. You want to make sure that your friends are all in alignment. If you can keep your friends from, from uh, taking, going, leaning in too much to one side, awesome. Um, you need to also make sure that the kids are doing well in school and in their social lives. And I'm going to tell you that the real danger here really comes up when the divorce is finished. In the first year after the divorce is finished, the studies show that that's when children nosedive. And the reason is what happened for them when the divorce is finished, they have technically failed. When the divorce has finished, they have not succeeded in saving you from getting divorced by being on their best behaviors. So you and the other parent are going, oh, thank God that's over. Thank God that expense is over. Thank God we're finished with this. Thank God we're moving on. Your child is going, oh, crap. My parents are really not going to get together. And so they tend to nosedive here. So you want to pay extra attention to them at this point in time. All right. As usual, I want you to reach out to me with any questions and, or concerns. I want you to share this with other people. This is a really important piece. Oh, also, you need to know that in January, we are doing one or maybe two, maybe even three special workshops on just this topic. So check out our website, richinrelationship.com. I'm going to make sure it's on there. Check out our Facebook page. And if you're, if you're not sure where to go, reach out to me and um, I'll at rich at richinrelationship.com and I'll make sure that you can get to those free workshops. We've got like a 16 page workshop, a workbook for these workshops. You're going to walk away with serious next steps. As usual, this is Rich Heller. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Rich in Relationship.